Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, we'll get started now. Um, we do have talking bagels coming. They're just half an hour late. Um, so, yeah, this week is on kind of the meeting of stormwater and transit, and Ann Gelman and Dave Larson will talk more about that right after. I do a quick introduction. Um, so I just want to say thank you all for coming. And then to um, the Green Minnesota Green Corps program, both site applications are still open until March 18th. One of the program tracks for Minnesota Green Corps is stormwater. So if your city is looking to do stormwater work, the Minnesota Green Corps program would be a great option for you to work on that. And so, we do have a member here. Yeah, we have a couple members couple. here. Um, and there's some flyers and the stands by the door, and so March 18th is the deadline for both sites. Um, so next up then we have Anne. All right, well thanks everyone for coming. My name is Ann Gelfman. I work at the Minnesota Solutions Control Agency in the stormwater section. I see some familiar faces here. Thanks, thanks so much for coming. I think we have a really good lineup of speakers this morning. Patrick and I have been working on putting together this the speakers for you um, as it relates to stormwater and living streets. So really excited about this workshop today. Um, so David and I are um, topic leads for Green Step Cities. I'm the topic lead for stormwater. David is the, is the topic lead for transportation. And so these two practices are kind of coming together. I just wanted to highlight some of the stormwater practices that relate to um, living streets or transportation. So uh, we have five different practices, green step practices in stormwater. And if you look at um, best practice number 3A, so that one is uh, regarding narrowing streets. And there are several cities, Burnsville, for example, Sue, hi. hi. Um, they have an ordinance that um, requires narrower streets uh, without getting into all the detail. If you're interested in finding out more about that, you can go to who's doing it and click on that practice and then it'll tell you what Burnsville is doing for narrow streets. Um, another practice uh, where we have the stormwater uh, transportation connection is in 5C which is at the bottom of the screen here, green alleys or green parking lots. And again, uh, yesterday I went through that to see who's doing it. Uh, the city of St. Paul, the Hamlin Library has a green parking lot. There are so many green alleys and green parking lots. And if you have this in your city, please add it because I know, you know, permeable pavement, as you'll hear from Mark and others, is, is very popular um, in Minnesota, and I don't think cities are getting enough credit for the practices that they have. So if you are a green step city and you have a green alley or a green parking lot with permeable pavers or permeable asphalt or concrete, make sure you put it in your step and get credit for that. Um, also 5D, that's the previous permeable pavement or pavers. They're very similar and we might combine those in the future. Uh, but I did click on that to see who's doing it. Grand Marais, the city of Grand Marais, and uh, the city of Maplewood. But there again, I know there are a lot more that just need to get credit for it. And then the other practice that's related to stormwater and transportation um, is way at the bottom, can you go with 5F? which is the tree trenches and the tree boxes. Um, and we see these along the um, green line. Um, a lot of tree trenches and tree boxes, Maplewood Mall, uh, Marquette um, Street in Minneapolis. Again, this is another practice that's really gaining popularity. We're seeing more and more of these in the state. So if you our Green Step City and you are doing these tree trenches, please um, as a, um, add them to your practices because again, I know there's a lot more than what's listed in there now. Um, 
I, I wanted to highlight um, a really good resource for all of you for all of these practices, and that is our Minnesota Stormwater Manual. If you're not familiar with that, uh, we we created that in a media wiki format about two years ago, um, and it's a it's an excellent resource for all of these practices. So. If you're interested in implementing any of these practices for stormwater, you can go to the Minnesota Stormwater Manual, the, the wiki format, and do a search. And the guidance um, and design guidance and all sorts of really good information are listed in the manual for all of these practices. So I just wanted to make sure you were all aware of that. So David, you want to talk about the transportation? and then we'll get on to the lineup of our case studies. Good morning, everyone. I'm David Larson with the Office of Environmental Stewardship at the uh, Department of Transportation. And on the Green Steps website, some of the links in that transit area that I think you'd find helpful would be complete streets, context-sensitive solutions, and the street design guide that's in there. Um, what I wanted to share with you today, and this is probably more in the uh, camp of the case studies, is talk to you about a project in Cosmos that we did a few years ago. Um, but before I do that, just a sort of a view of the state. At PennDOT, where we manage state and interstate highways, you can see it's a fairly small percentage of the total roads we have here in Minnesota. So if we think of 140,000 roads in Minnesota, all the public rights away make up that, that total. So your driveway, the roadway into the cabin, farm access road, logging roads would be in addition to that. And MnDOT is responsible for only 8.5% of that. And within that, uh, that right away of these 12,000 miles, um, we have 175 acres of green space. It's always exciting when the state highway is the downtown of a small community because then there's really an opportunity to uh, try to implement some of these uh, practices we're going to be talking about today. So out in Cosmos, Cosmos is west of the Twin Cities, about 65 miles. Highway 7 straight west, you get to Hutchinson, another 20 miles, and you're in Cosmos. So we were rebuilding Highway 4 through Cosmos. And Cosmos, uh, they have a lot of fun. Back up. They have a lot of fun with their, uh, with their theme. Uh, they had just completed their new water tower when I went out for my first visit. And they call Highway 7 Astro Boulevard. Highway 4 is Milky Way Street. And all of the uh, northwest streets are named after our planets. And then the uh, east-west avenues are um, after the constellations. So they have a lot of fun with this. <laughs> our right-of-way on Highway 4 is a 100-foot right-of-way. In the downtown area, the commercial area, lanes and sort of a free-for-all is parking, angled parking. <clears throat> so they had the two through ways, 30 feet of angled parking, so it was uh, not too difficult to park in Cosmos. The new design actually brought in 22 feet of green space dedicated to rain garden areas. And we were able to increase the sidewalk by one foot still provided angled parking on the one side, but then went to a parallel parking design on the other, and could potentially be striped with bike lanes. At MnDOT, we're often increasing capacity. We're pushing everything out. The idea of a road diet is very foreign. We're looking at multimodal, talking about complete streets, trying to bring in as accommodations for as many modes as possible. So this was really a good opportunity to also build in a lot of additional green space. So we provided the angle parking on this side, 
a ball out of the sidewalk to decrease the crossing distance. And this side, 22 feet of additional green space with these series of rain gardens and then parallel parking. Just a detail of, of some of that treatment. Um, and the soil modification in the uh, planting areas. Showing the, the modified topsoil borrow being placed in these uh, rain garden areas. And we have uh, drain cleanouts. And this was shortly after the planting, so a lot of the perennials are just uh, uh, sticking out of the, the rock mulch. But the serious road diet was really over in the residential area. We had 76 feet of pavement in front of everyone's house. And we went to 40 feet of pavement. So that 36 additional feet became an opportunity to add some green infrastructure. Uh, the old design, it was green ash on the boulevard just a, a monoculture of green ash. So in doing the new layout, it was really an opportunity to, to uh, clear and grow the green ash and then try to salvage and maintain um, any specimen tree that was right near the construction zone. So we, we took some uh, fairly uh, aggressive measures to protect those trees in the process. This was a tree inventory and uh, really don't have time to, to delve into the details of that today. But I just wanted to share that uh, it was an opportunity to uh, get rid of the ash, which with the emerald ash borer uh, marching westward, um, it wasn't, no one in the community was, was uh, sad to see the green ash go. Um, and we came back in with a very diverse uh, palette of trees putting in the coffee tree, uh, two types of elms, four types of uh, honey locusts, hackberry, uh, a couple types of oaks, and tree lilac. So the old curb line used to be right here. The ash were removed and, and replaced with the diversity of trees that I mentioned. Uh, the sidewalk was increased from four feet to six feet, and all the drainage is handled so that it's obviously moving away from the yard, uh, allowing the curb through here. The sidewalk moves into this area, and we're, we even brought it back into the curb. So we're trying to hold as much of the stormwater um, in those green spaces as possible. And for the trees, is there any other um, vertical structuring of soil to help the trees get more water? Well, the, the goal was to put in a stock hole type soil system with large rock to smaller rock to more of a planting medium and, and forego the storm sewer system. But that was just a little too too aggressive, a little too uh, creative. Um, so we still have the traditional storm sewer system in place. And then we have a modified uh, four feet of uh, modified topsoil for the planting area. So we end up with uh, 18 additional feet on each side of the road. Everyone's front yard is increased. Obviously, the driveways are longer. So we're looking at 76 to 40, but the impervious isn't quite that much because of the, the larger sidewalk and then longer driveways, but still a, a much greater green space and uh, just a much more livable street. So, any, any questions? Um, both, both the city and MnDOT. You know the the idea of potential percolating into basements and businesses uh, during a heavy rain event was not somewhere anyone wanted to go. But it was interesting to explore the the possibility and the capacity of a a structure or system like that, um, but we still have the, the traditional pipe out there. Now the rain garden areas, we do have a um, 
drain tile in there, and that's tying in to the uh, storm sewer system. Um, those types of roads, like I think historically, probably had a uh, very diverse set of users, like community and rural type vehicles. So is the assumption going forward that those types of users are no longer there, or that they can live with the design? Um, yeah, let me uh, go to this area again. Um, try to repeat the question. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, the question was. Oops. Yeah, now you switched to a bigger view. Oh, okay. All right. The question uh, relates to different users of these uh, rural systems, and and are we not? Accommodating all those users. Am I, am I getting the question correct? Yeah, just think of vehicle distribution. Right? These, those right of ways being 100 feet wide. You know, there were people were picturing a different type of use at some point. Yeah. Right, and we did take that into consideration here because generally we would go down to an 11 foot lane, um, and we would really tighten up the parking, have as small as an 8 foot parking bay. But knowing that there's a lot of farm implements that are going through this area. Um, we still were using a, a larger 12-foot lane and this bike lane. This community is only a population of 500. We're not striking in this bike lane, but we show it as potential for striking in the bike lane. So you essentially have the availability of 18 feet in addition to the parking. So farm, farm implements and large equipment was certainly a factor here. Are you, are you starting to see the culture of MnDOT change in regard to uh, planting something besides grass in rights of way areas along major roadways? If we can have some kind of partnership with maintenance, certainly. Because whatever we put out there, it's, uh, it's not going to do well on its own. So we need some eyes and uh, attention to maintenance. So if, if we have that kind of partnering happening, we, we certainly promote that idea. I've heard that there's, there used to be the funding within the metro area for planting along the freeway right of ways in the Twin Cities, like for people to put in buffer plants kind of like near the, near the edges of the freeway. I don't know if that's still happening. On the non right of way? I think you do it on the, on like the city side of the fence or whatever, um, but I'm not sure they still have that funding plan. Yeah, if, if our right of way goes beyond the fence, then it's certainly el eligible for uh, what we call our roadside uh, community roadside partnership program. Okay, yeah. And uh, that's a volunteer effort to put the plants in, but then the community gets reimbursed by the state for the plant material. And again, there's there's a commitment to uh, maintain that once once it's been planted. It's been a really successful program, and the metro district uh, sets aside a million dollars a year for that program, and then each outlying district is anywhere from twenty to forty thousand uh, per year. And we have uh, well over two hundred communities that have uh, used the partnership program. Thank you. Thank you. Before Patrick introduces the next speaker, I just wanted to add uh, Laura Milberg, uh, my colleague at the MPCA, mentioned that there is another uh, Green Step practice number seven that deals with resiliency. 29. 29, sorry. Um, that I apologize, but I wasn't aware of until today. There's just so much going on with Green Step, it's hard to keep up. Um, but it deals with resiliency and stormwater and transportation. So just make sure you take a look at that one and if you're doing any of those practices that you get credit for those. Or if you're not doing them, do them. Thanks. <laughs> Fred, if you could 
maybe wait just a minute. Okay. If you want to grab a little bit of coffee, go ahead. Um, and so on the webinar, the next presentation will start in just a couple minutes. Okay.
the second goal for this uh, uh, North St. Paul Green Infrastructure master, master Plan was to reduce the amount of hard surface. Traffic and by doing these curb extensions, and when working with the uh, community, is one of their their biggest complaints about their streets is that people are driving too fast. It's dangerous to get out there and walk. So by narrowing streets, bringing in these bump piles, you calm traffic, which is a great advantage to the people that live there. Um, maybe less so if you're zooming through town, but that's really not the goal to get people to zoom through town. Um, and through bike and Pedestrian circulation, either by creating uh, bike lanes or adding sidewalks in North St. Paul. In many of our communities, sidewalks were never put in. Uh, and when there's a greater desire for people to walk, uh, they're, they're not accommodated. Uh, that was certainly the case in North St. Paul. And the uh, urban forest, by first protecting what you have, uh, like David showed in the Cosmos example, and then bringing in more to uh, get a diversity of age class in that urban forest. And then, to, you know, we sidewalks around to the trees we had to. Um, another big goal of theirs was cost, that they didn't want this green infrastructure uh, project to cost any more if they were just replacing what they had. And that by narrowing streets and reducing uh, height, they were able to, to balance those costs. And then lastly, they want to reduce their long-term maintenance costs. That's everybody's goal. You know, the investment today is fine. Often, it's the maintenance that really drives people crazy because that's ongoing cost, especially with uh, stormwater features. Um, we get a lot of flack about, uh, yeah, we would build this, we're happy to build it, but we don't want to take care of it. You may have heard that before. Um, so there are ways to design them so that they are lower maintenance. That's the best that we can do. But Water uh, basin, all the green infrastructure, the filters. So just like the filter in your car uh, or in other filters we have, we have to change them. You know, they, they do need to be, we have to accept that. So and looking at what was proposed here, a typical residential street, and I think in uh, our community's residential streets are a huge opportunity. In our St. Paul, uh, a lot of these will need to be dug up because of aging water rain every street in town in the next 10 or 15 years uh, is going to have to be replaced. So that means a lot of streets in Germany. So why spend a lot of money accommodating a street that isn't really used to see how many cars are parked on the street? So in a lot of situations, one parking lane is a limit and parking on one side of the street is suggested um, because it just isn't needed. With this uh, length of driveways, two or three car garages, you know, there's just plenty of, of parking within their, their property. Uh, it's just big events, the graduation or something, that the street might get filled up. But that's really not very often and not worth designing for that extreme event. So how did you, or how did the city of North St. Paul keep the project from derailing from one person coming to council and saying, gosh, you know, they're taking away the parking outside my house proper? Great question, because it did derail. It completely derailed in, in North St. Paul. I wasn't really going to go into this because I wanted to have the ever after story. Um, they ended up getting a huge grant, a clean water fund, to even implement uh, this on a residential street project. And we did this very long community engagement process, and there were a few very vocal people that closed down the city council. The city council was unanimous in approving this green infrastructure plan, but it would keep the bills in first street. Uh, it, they, they didn't support the, the redesign because there were a few both very vocal people who wanted the wide street. So, but what did happen is uh, because this is all uh, funded by the Rift Washington Metro Watershed District, which is also working with the city of Maplewood next door, that grant got transferred over there and we'll see the results of that. And there it didn't get. by a few local people. There, the city council was very firm, and they've been rather progressive. Uh, Maplewood has been one of, I think, probably the first 
community in Minnesota to implement rainwater gardens back in about 1990, 1992. So they've had a long history. They know that the benefits. And they, they were just firm. Like, this makes sense. It's going to save us money. It's going to save us maintenance. Um, it uses less resources. We get shade trees. You know, we're treating stormwater. The advantages just are outweighed. And maybe we would have got organized collection to prevent so many trucks. Yeah. <laughs> Smart. I just have a general question. When you say you want to improve the quality of stormwater runoff, are there uh, is there actually measurements of that? Like you actually can quantify the like outlets or something? Yeah, so the question is can you measure improvement of water quality through using rainwater gardens and other Devices and the answer is yes. It's, you do that through uh, devices that are installed with pipes and, and uh, measure. Primary, the primary uh, aspect that is monitored is the volume of water that's reduced because that's easier to maintain. There are some water quality, and when you re reduce the volume running off, you re reduce the pollutants running off too because that phosphorus is going into the ground where it can fertilize plants rather than into the lake. Fertilizes algae, so um, it's a bit harder to monitor for water quality because that takes sampling, automatic sampling. Yeah. Equipment is a little, it's out there, it's a little difficult to run, or you have to run out during the storm event and take samples and get them out of the But there are people doing that. It is there. It does happen. Mm -hmm. um, so here's what was suggested and adopted by the city council in a residential street. The orange lines are where the curb exists today, and then uh, the curb was brought in. Um, so there's the reduction of the impervious surface. With two driving lanes were preserved and one parking lane. Um, this is called a yield street. So if two cars are passing each other, either you wait and you wait or you pull off open parking bay to, to get people through. And there's another aspect of traffic. People in these, these residents really don't like teenagers coming down their streets when they take their kids down the street, especially um, if there isn't a sidewalk. Like in the community, there weren't many. We did add a sidewalk uh, in this plan, along with rainwater garden. So with the, the green infrastructure part, the uh, stormwater part, I think the whole idea is to make room for it. How can we make room for rainwater gardens or other stormwater treatment? Here, by uh, reducing the impervious surface, some places the right-of-way is wide enough that you can accommodate that, uh, but often it isn't. Um, so the three trees, those are the primary com uh, components of this concept. So this is actually a St. Louis Park, where there is a 22-foot wide street showing where there's one parking lane, no parking on one side of the street, and two driving. And what that looks like is if two cars are passing each other. And then, of course, uh, bringing stormwater treatment facilities, rainwater gardens, uh, along the street to capture that stormwater. Increasing the, the urban canopy because there's a lot of value with air quality, uh, reducing um, urban heat island effect, providing habitat. Everybody likes the tree. So when we give them room to grow, they It's actually in my neighborhood, South Minneapolis, about four years ago, and half of those trees are now gone. They're all ash, and the city is totally removed. Um, so in looking at some of the corridors uh, in North St. Paul, here you can see two parking lanes, two driving lanes. Uh, you can see on the left there, there's no, nobody parking there. This is at 4 o'clock in the afternoon on a weekday. Um, it is next to a park, um, but a lot of that parking is in use. So when you start thinking about what can we do, you know, a parking count is, is a good first step to understand if you can reduce the amount of parking. And here, um, See on the left, um, are again, the uh, orange lines are the, the previous curve, and then 
how the road was narrowed. We got down to one parking lane, two, uh, two bike lanes, and two driving lanes. We got rid of parking on, on that other side of the street. So I'm curious why instead of doing uh, two bike lanes next to each other, you know, going two directions where they don't have Um, that is certainly a way to do it. This was just an early concept and uh, one idea. So I think what you're suggesting, having the them on, on the same side of the street, might have to be up there. Um, and I guess that would be a matter of statement. So what are the statements? So um, creating more room for rainwater gardens, certainly street trees. And again, there was no sidewalk on the previous plan. Um, so that can look like in, in concept with simulation. And then on their north south street, um, which has got very little parking because all the residential uh, properties face the east west street, then they, we suggest taking out all the parking except where there might be some sort of need, like a church. That way, we've got down to two driveways and two two bike lanes and adding the sidewalk. Again, the orange shows where the curve is. So just things to think about. Think about how you can reduce the impervious surface. Again, it's all about study uh, and working with your community to determine what, what's needed really and what is. As you can imagine, when you start to take out this much pavement, when you rebuild the street, you save a lot of money. And when you go to repair the street, you save a lot of money. You put down less salt. Quite a we have. <coughs> so there, there's a lot of uh, implementation and maintenance. This is not North St. Paul, they say don't go to the Although, I don't know, it'll be warm out today, maybe we're there. <laughs> All right, so just to zoom through these benefits, there's a lot of economic, economic benefits. Uh, lower maintenance costs, lowering uh, investment costs, construction costs, increases property values. If you live on a nice street, street line, the garden, your home is more valuable, and it sparks economic revitalization uh, um, For community wise, it gets children more active, it gives them a place to bike, a place to walk. And certainly, seniors are, are looked for for these opportunities. Increase public safety because kids aren't walking in the street. There's a lot of in North St. Paul they're looking at safe routes in schools um, and decided that they would really worth the effort to fight to put the sidewalk at least on one side of the street. At least the original goal they would say that was worth it. Um, and then, of course, it creates a separate Environment, environmental benefits, increased water quality and air quality by the rainwater garden trees, reducing the urban heat island effect, and sequesters carbon uh, when we reduce the amount of pavement um, and allow plants to grow. Um, I think this is really important as we're facing climate change, and you know, today is and the future is a really prime example of what's happening and what's going to continue to happen. Um, when we look at climate change, we, we can look at two aspects. We can look at adaptation, and that's what we design for extreme events like flooding, severe heat, high winds. You know, how are we going to react to that? And then on the other side, we also need to be preventing. How can we how can we stop releasing as much CO2 into the atmosphere? How can we slow that down? And I think we will put a lot more CO2 in the atmosphere with the reconstruction of streets as we have to do. But can we design them a little? Less intensively, so that we're not burning as much fossil fuel, we're not mining as much um, minerals to build these streets, pumping as much oil, uh, as much concrete, which is very uh, energy intensive. And in the end, save money. Save money. So the case is pretty strong. Human nature is on the other side of it. <laughs> we want everything and we want to save. So that's that's the the, the conflict in the past. But you know, if you come with a strong argument and just 
go back up. Okay, so here's, here's we have a few questions from online. Okay, um, from Shannon Pink in St. Louis Park. Are there long-term studies that um, prove um, the prove the maintenance savings over time for these properties over typical street design? Is, is there any long-term studies? Um, we, I'm trying to think in the, we did some projections, and this is in the North St. Paul uh, green, infrastructure, green Infrastructure Master Plan. We did some predictions, you know, by having less pavement to resurface the steel coat, the plow, and so uh, we did some projections in that document. I'm going to say this. But if you went online, you'll find that. Send the Ramsey Washington Metro Watershed District website. So here, um, here is the project that was built. Um, the money that was going to go through St. Paul. Um, this was a uh, typical street reconstruction project in Maplewood. They were doing the project anyway, trying to rebuild the street, um, and they were very interested in looking at alternatives. Um, they ended up narrowing the street from uh, eliminating a parking lane. Um, let's see, there was a mile and a half of here and they added the mile and a half of the new sidewalk, one side of the street sidewalk, and instead of um, a six foot sidewalk, narrowed it to a four street, four foot sidewalk, and people can walk abreast of the four feet the wide sidewalk here easily. Um, so they reduced the amount of pavement by one acre in this neighborhood and certainly improved livability. Um, so where this is located is museum is right here. So the corporate headquarters off of 94 and McKnight. Um, that property, which is comes up right here. So this is Minnehaha Avenue East, just north of 3M. If you're going to go over here, Meyer and then the far east uh, street. You can go look at this. Uh, another aspect is up here. Uh, it's a park. We ended up putting in a um, regional stormwater treatment infiltration here you see the, the rainwater gardens that were put in and street trees. So um, this too had a long community engagement process and we did a lot of work to get people to post rainwater gardens on their property. Well, not on their property, but in front of their property is the right of way. Um, and we had pretty good success. We did a lot of door to door um, uh, knocking get people involved and of the possible sites because not every site could accommodate a rainwater garden because of slopes and uh, trees, etc. We got 50% participation, which was, was really quite good. Of those possible, 50% of people posted a rainwater garden. Um, so we narrowed here the streets from 32 to Street curb is kept here. The curb was at the end of the sidewalk there. Um, eliminated a parking lane, open sidewalk. There's a community art component, which I'll, I'll show you pictures of. Rainwater. So these are the features in, in that project. So here to what that looks like. Again, uh, curb was there. The curb was back here. These trees that were added, some of the trees they even added, the city was willing to put on private property. They so went across over just over the, the, the right of way. Um, see the rainwater garden, of course, the sidewalk, the rainwater garden, some areas. Um, and then the narrowing of the street. So there are 32 rainwater gardens in this um, neighborhood at one regional infiltration um, basin and 200. Trees and together they require 40 pounds of carbon a year. So, where that none of that could have been in the previous sense of small cave, there were no trees, no rain gardens. These are the benefits that we did. Um, we were able to block the question of carbon, and then with the additional trees, shading of the pavement reduces. This is, I think it was done, uh, finished three years ago. And so without the extra funding from the grant, 
with cities have to come up with their own stormwater infrastructure fund to kind of like for that through a stormwater utility fee, or how do you pay for this without, or do you just have to wait around for grants? Um, well, it, what we the data shows is that basically you can break even. You say, I have to rebuild the street, you're rebuilding the street, you're placing the sewers, you're doing all that. By narrowing the street um, and reducing that investment, you're saving a lot of money. And it may not break even totally, you may need to spend a little more money, um, but in the typical city uh, process of funding, they, they can afford it. And I'll show you how the, the numbers work out. So uh, in these rainwater gardens, um, in, over the course of a year, 50% of the water that falls on the impervious surface uh, that contributes to the rainwater water garden is infiltrated. 40% of that rate is only 10% one well. That's very much similar to uh, undisturbed landscape. Is there an increase in potential for mosquitoes when you collect water after a storm? Yeah, excellent question, that is, and that is, is there potential for more mosquitoes? These are all designed to, to dry down within 24 hours. I don't have any that, that go any slower than that. There's, these, these are filtration basins, so there's a drain tile under them. Soils were variable. Some were sandy enough to infiltrate, but a lot of it was kind of clay. So we have to put the drain tile in. Um, so they draw, draw down fast. Regardless of if, if it, you have a drain tile or not, we always design them so that they do draw down within 20, 24 to 48 hours. And, and if mosquitoes really need something like five days of wa still warm water above 70 degrees to, to hatch. So these will not increase the amount of mosquitoes. Unless for some reason they're not working in water today, then, then they got to Here, um, the public art component of the, the, these raindrops, which were sandblasted into the sidewalk. Um, here you can see you know, the profile of the street, the car park, very easily two cars can probably pass each other alongside that, that car. I have a quick question. Um, you were kind of saying that you did a lot of door knocking, and it sounds to me like the homeowners that went to the rain gardens had to almost sign up. Yeah, they had to sign up. Mm -hmm. So are they? I'm guessing that they would be charged with maintaining them. Yeah. Is that kind of is that kind of controlled through a covenant of some sort, like a legal? No, there's no. We try. We pretty much don't do that. We, um, we find that these are people's front yards, and if they're willing to have them, they're they're willing to take care of them. If they're not, they look bad, and it's you know construction on them. So um, I know some communities do that. I just didn't know if like the properties change hands, you know. If yep, that's always a issue. Yeah, right? that's always a concern, but it's kind of the, it seems to work in social pressure. Uh -huh. That these need to feel so good. They could always simplify them. Yeah, and, and just plant them very simply. You might even be able to plant a facade in them and, and they'll, they'll work. Oh, I um. So I was out a few different times taking pictures of this after it had been constructed and asking people what they thought of it and the whole process. Especially I wanted to hear about the narrower street. And the only complaints I was hearing was about the construction itself, which was um, that it was dragged on too long and they didn't like the dust, but asking about the width of the street and the parking, nobody had any. The youngsters, I mean, the people with the children, the sidewalk leads right down the road to the park. Um, they're very happy with the sidewalk. They no longer have to walk. So here is that park at the end of the street where the kids are going, and this regional infiltration basement. Uh, the water comes in and floods the type of streets underneath, spreads out, so and a huge storm event overflows. Um, you can see the cost is it gets uh, $560,000 for the Clean Water Grant, uh, Ramsey, Washington, Metro, Watershed District also contributed, and that's a great source of, of money in the Watershed District um, in your city. Um, 
will do um, matching grants um, for any other project, but I would say this will be your first place to look for, for additional funding. Um, uh, assessment, $733,000 for general funds and city, um, a million and a half, and then stormwater utility funds. So, Um, one, uh, another project, this is 37th Avenue Greenway in North Minneapolis, and this is a street, um, mainly a flooding control project, um, where this part of town at one time was, was a wetland, a cool spot, uh, had been built many years ago in the 1920s to build homes, um, and has experienced flooding, especially as our storm events Here um, on a East West Street, uh, 37th Avenue, um, well, the home space, the, the name street, so the side street, no home space. So parking wasn't as necessary here, and the third street wasn't as necessary. But here the whole street was closed, um, and a greenway was put in, which led to be an avenue to, to a park. Here, the idea was to create a lot of storage in underground vaults, uh, having the stormwater filters and rainwater gardens first before closing those vaults, um, and then creating a pedestrian green. And here's what this looks like after construction um, with large vaults underground under, under the, the walkway, uh, rainwater gardens planting that. Water filtration before it gets down to the basement. Um, the trail, of course, uh, and this is really quite popular. The neighborhood is emphatic about this. And this is in North Minneapolis in a uh, poor neighborhood. Uh, and as you can see, I didn't have to go through and pick up garbage before I took the picture. <laughs> it was picked up. And there are neighbors that are, are very proud of this, and they pick up the garbage. Here's the, the vaults that are underneath during construction, so there's a huge amount of water that is stored and then slowly released into the Crystal Lake. Um, this is the other shot of the rainwater garden at one block. It has to accommodate some traffic, but in a very narrow and no parking situation. Yeah, so, uh, again, this is leading down to the park at the end. Um, so this has greatly reduced the flooding. Uh, there's a number of garages that would flood really quite frequently, and that has eliminated the flood. The money came from the utility fee? Yeah, this was all funded by the city. And wasn't that the state They did get money, that's right. They got about a million dollars. State revolving fund through our um, state revolving fund. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, I'm going to just zip through a little over, but I'm going to zip through one more project really quickly because David brought it up. Um, and that's the sweetest tree trench. The sweetest tree trench is a method of growing trees. That's why it was, how it was developed. But some of us over here have retrofitted that to accommodate stormwater. And this is a project at Maplewood Mall where um, I mean, the idea is that trees in urban areas where they all pavement don't grow because there's no place for them to grow. And in um, Sweden and Germany, they found that in areas where there was enough oxygen in the soil, primarily in sites. Um, they discovered hanging roots, uh, a lot of resistance where there was a large tree. So oxygen being one of the primary limiting factors to growth of the trees. So they figured out by creating rock that is compacted, that means there's 40% gap between the rock for oxygen. Um, we're about that here with soil wash in between that the, the rock which is compacted um, before the soil is washed in. 
so they can end up having a large fire rooting volume uh, for the tree and the park fires and sidewalks. So, as you can imagine, these are expensive systems, and they're really the last resort. And you do them in downtown and like Bigwood Mall, where you know really that pavement there, where you want to grow trees and treat stormwater. So I think we. These ended up to be about twenty thousand dollars a tree. So it's really a last resort, and I would say David in, in Cosmos probably didn't need to a rainwater garden to get space for rainwater garden was probably a, a great choice. If you're parking cars on top of this, then it, uh, then you want to resort to this. And basically what happens is uh, water comes in and catch basin and, and fills this up from the bottom, fills the water. In the gas, wet soil, washed into the rock, and then drains out. It's kind of like a retention piece. Uh, the water and sediment filters out, and that way, water the tree, holds water, and then it's And here are just a couple shots of during construction. This is what the trench looks like. Where the stormwater inlets are, and the trees are placed on that. Some of the first layers of rock, second layers of rock, and then they hose in the soil into that, and then um, put this uh, structure on the surface and plant the tree. So, um, a great uh, method of growing trees and treating stormwater, but really um, the most expensive and a rest last resort that you really do it in a you know, maybe this intersection would be a great place where they're, they're and well, in fact, it is because they have. It them. is, here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, really, just a, a last resort, but a great, um, a great method. And at uh, at Maplewood Mall, they were we were able to accommodate, uh, and there was 200 of these of the trees and a, a mile of tree trench. And able to capture a half inch storm event, and it turned out that it was able to infiltrate a quarter inch of the storm event. So, a pretty good percentage of uh, water quality. Yeah. So, what do you mean by last resort? Uh, are, are you saying that a developer that wants to build out more than the associated land has capacity for a stormwater, a traditional stormwater pond, and then, you know, in order to get the project to work? That kind of cost is then justified, or, or what, what do you mean? What I mean by last resort is because this is a whole suite of stormwater treatment practices, like ponds, like infiltration basins, like permeable pavement. Um, what I'm saying is, if you have the green space, you know, in a more suburban street uh, where there is more green space, there's no need to, and you don't need to pave everything, then there's no need to bury all this rock and spend all that money. You can just Greater rainwater, much cheaper, and um, uh, probably more effective because you can store more water. So I just mean if you have the space, it, if the last resort wouldn't, you don't have any space for anything. When you have to go underground to treat storm water, which is basically this is, then it gets really expensive, and you want to try to avoid that at all costs, and it's more difficult. So a project comes in and there's a traditional island planting bed with shade trees. How do, how are you converting a developer from doing that? Because that person, that company is going to be long gone by the time those trees die in their usual seven to eleven year cycle. To, to convert yeah. them to doing something like this is stratospherically more expensive. Well, the developer, I mean, the only thing you can, you mean the the only control you have is with stormwater regulation and are they treating enough stormwater? And so when they look at their the suite of opportunities for that, then they choose the one that works the most. And if they want 100%, 95% pavement, then they're going to have to go to the below ground. But, you know, you're right. If they do a narrow, uh, there's no stopping them to do a narrow uh, island and plant a few trees in and not do, unless you have city ordinances that are saying, uh, you know, how to treat the soil, how much body you need the tree, and all that. Um, the only the only leverage you have is a little bit. Okay. 
I was able to take questions as we went, and I'm uh, behind, so I think I'll wrap this up and get to our panel. So we have had um, EOR talking about Edana Street construction at St. Paul's West Side Flat first, but they're going to go last. Um, so we'll have Mark Maloney, director from the City of Shoreview, go next. Minnesota, where I work, I've been a public works director there for uh, close to 23 years now. Uh, we're a second tier, typical kind of suburb in the North Metro area here in the Twin Cities market. Uh, we're characterized by rapid growth in the 1970s and 80s, and that puts a real date stamp on our infrastructure. Uh, we're pretty much all built out. Uh, we have this characteristic a full 33% of the area of our community is parks, open space, or water bodies. I think uh, when you drive through my community, you get the impression we have a lot of development potential, but really we're done. It is kind of uh, what you see. And, and uh, consequently, people who live in Shoreview uh, tell us on a regular basis in a number of different ways that the quality of life indicators, the reasons why they live in the community, uh, the things that motivate them to want to stay in the community have a lot to do with water quality, uh, parks and open space, uh, natural amenities. Uh, trail system, uh, all, all sorts of things, but um, water is a big deal. If you tell my map, we're in the middle of an area where water is a really big deal. And uh, we, are, uh, green step, we are in the green step program, we're at step three. I think we help pilot some of the step four stuff, but uh, as of now, we're at step three city. So, I told you about infrastructure, and the first thing I draw you is something like street sweeping. Um, I, I wanted to share this with uh, long before I worked in Shoreview, in 1980, the city of Shoreview made a very strong correlation between street sweeping and water quality. We were maybe a little bit ahead of the curve compared to some communities. We have 100 miles of city streets, and that includes about 10,000 square yards of permeable pavement that are public infrastructure. We have mechanical brush and air sweepers, and sometimes you'll see them out in tandem. As I stand here, we have swept all the streets in Shoreview courts already this year. We've got one full sweeping in already. And we need all streets, all streets in the city are swept a minimum of six times. And, and if that sounds excessive, um, it's, it is compared to a lot of communities in this market. But there's a lot of in, information and research out there that shows that, uh, mostly from the West Coast, I believe, that shows that we're probably not sweeping enough um, for water quality purposes. So, street sweeping, big part of what we do. Uh, we're, as I mentioned, we're all built out. All the opportunities we have for innovation for stormwater management EMPs kind of are in a retrofit context. So we've been doing things like this. Um, this is not a plug and sales pitch or anything, but there's a particular product. Uh, these filters by context. Um, we're using these as filter bays. Those little black canisters are, I don't know, uh, 18 inches in diameter, and they're filter medium. And over a period of time, they um, trap contaminants stormwater and you replace the, the canisters you don't want to replace their uh, just filters you get. We've, the longest ones we've had in the ground in Shoreview are uh, been there for five years and we're planning on replacing those cartridges and actually have to have the stars already. It's highly dependent on the full character of these canisters that last quite a while. Uh, other things that were uh, implemented in Shoreview, things you may be familiar with, you've heard about the Saffle Baffle, uh, to replace to, to retrofit into existing transport. Um, you can see that we've experimented a little bit with these catch baits and filter inserts where we didn't have 
have uh, and have them moved into any other type of stormwater PMP. So again, in phase of those inserts, a lot of those catch basins are little filter canisters. Again, kind of a uh, thing you need to go into eyes wide open. You're buying uh, future responsibility and you know, budget for those things. But we have a lot of this kind of stuff in our community. We're not shy about trying uh, different things. Uh, here's an example. Um, if you're familiar with my community, this is a pond. The two pictures on the top are the before, and the two pictures on the bottom are the after. This is a pond in front of Target on Lexington Avenue in Shoreview. This was a 1980-era dirt detention pond, poorly maintained and uh, probably not widely understood by the property owners. We retrofitted that uh, in 2013 as a multi-cell sand filter facility. We took it over. It had been privately owned and maintained. We were one of those communities back in the 1970s and 80s that thought the best approach to stormwater management was to push it much of it off into private hands. And uh, as the NPDES realities unfolded, um, we learned that we're responsible for all of it anyways, one way or the other. So um, we're taking these things over and we're just fighting the bullet and saying these are public infrastructure. The only way you're going to have insurance that we have a sustainable approach to stormwater management. The city is in the city is in charge. We're not going anywhere. The property owners change over, the management changes over, the philosophy is lost in the shuffle. Um, Shortview has kind of fully embraced the idea that we're in charge of water quality. So I promised permeable pavements. Our community was a kind of an early innovator, um, not the earliest innovator, but an early market for using stormwater for uh, permeable pavements in conjunction with stormwater management. And what we've learned in our in our retrofit projects in our community is that stormwater management has really been driving innovation lately. Uh, my, my background is actually transportation and pavements. And so I am uh, very interested in asphalt and concrete and uh, down to a mechanistic kind of design level. The water aspect, the stormwater management aspect of uh, or design is something that I kind of learned in, in my experience. Um, permeable pavements give you the opportunity to address pavement and water quality issues kind of simultaneously. Uh, we were starting to get hit by PAH contaminated sediment in our pond dredging projects like uh, um, and we said, wow, taking care of stormwater and dirt ponds is an expensive and potentially uh, difficult thing going their approaches to stormwater management that reduce our exposure in that area. Permeable pavements um, have some promise in that area if you're eliminating a whole layer of infrastructure. Um, and one thing that I'm keenly interested in is the potential for permeable pavements to reduce of which are maintenance and or enhancing uh, fallout fluoride and groundwater in those areas. So anything that we can look at that reduces In 2007, the city of Shoreview, first public infrastructure project with a permeable pavement uh, was an alleyway. We learned a lot. We did it in an area that probably wouldn't have been an area you would have selected as a demonstration project for a permeable pavement. So this is about the worst place to put it yet. And uh, results were encouraging, not perfect. Uh, the technical information on the top are just uh, information that I've kind of was state of the art in 2007 for how you build a permeable pavement, how you put joints in it, how you cure it. Um, but this permeable pavement went in an area with really low infiltration of soils. We had pipes in the subgrade and drain the water out, kind of a redundant approach. Uh, it wasn't cost effective to say the least, but it was uh, getting our toe dipped in the pool here as far as um, permeable pavements. The one that uh, perhaps you've heard about in 2009 the largest permeable pavement system globally, um, and we put it next to Lake Owasso in um, southeast Shoreview. These streets averaged about 25 feet wide, a little under 9,000 square yards of pavement. This aerial photograph is of the north part of the neighborhood. There's actually a bump to or left would be the southern half of the neighborhood where the streets are actually narrower. Um, this is this project leverage, leverage everything we learned about our 2007 project, and this actually was selected because of high infiltration soils. Uh, these streets were paved, and there, uh, there is no storm sewer system. Every drop of 
and rather than pouring concrete, what's underneath what's underneath here is exactly the same as what you saw in that prior project. It was a separating layer, concrete curb and gutter, uh, filter rod. But rather than pouring concrete on the top and letting it cure and keeping people off of it from seven to ten days, this is a lot damage. Um, I worked with uh, someone who has created a product called, product called Patreon. And these things come out in sheets, they're lifted off by a crane, they're dropped in place. And um, you kind of see they bump them into place, they put them all together, they fit together like a puzzle. And that's this picture on the far right, it's what it looks like when it was done. Uh, they had poured the curb on one side and then dropped these sheets in and then pushed them, stepped them up against that curb and gutter. And then when that was all done, they came and poured the curb on the other side. Rather than trying to fit it between two curbs, they just plugged it up against one and then put the curb back in place. This was built in the fall of 2014. Uh, that's what it looked like in the first winter. Uh, some of you may have overheard my joke earlier about how these things perform in the winter. They perform the same way, or I suppose as all our streets perform. These streets are not salted. There is no de-icing chemical used on any of these permeable pavements that I showed you. I showed you. Uh, we're really taking the uh, industry's sales pitch to heart that says that you can get away with the different pavements when our pavements going to fall on these projects. That's the thing. So that's what that project looks like in the winter. Yeah, totally is it gravel at all, or is it just like totally just uh, The question is, is do we fill the gaps with um, fill the gaps with uh, gravel? And the answer is no. Those are uh, three eighths inch gaps between these concrete blocks. It might be hard to get a sense for the scale, but those are 11 inch wide blocks, and they're seven to eight inches thick. So these are not the patio pavers you go get at Menards for your backyard. These are a product that was designed with Federal Highway standard truck loading characteristics. This was a product that was built to be public infrastructure, not something to build for a landscaping purpose that's trying to adapt it to a public setting. But to answer your question, the permeability of this pavement system comes from the fact that there's nothing between the blocks. I have a question on the webinar from Teresa Keller. What's the life cycle of the pervious pavement? And then she had another one too. How many public stormwater ponds do you uh, In reverse order, I think we have about 175 ponds in the city that uh, were variations of completely artificially built stormwater detention basins all the way going back to modified. The other question was assumptions regarding life cycles for permeable pavements. Because these were paid for by taxpayers, in short, they had to go through our city council approval process to do the utility analysis, and our city council had to be convinced that this was a cost effective and prudent use of tax dollars. Inherent in all that is some assumption for how long it's going to last. It wouldn't make sense if this is all going to disintegrate in five years. But, um, we had enough information at the time we did our previous concrete project to conservatively estimate a 25 year life cycle for that. Um, one of the, I guess, you know, this is something I don't want to think about, but one of the characteristics of this particular approach is that you can replace, easily replace these channels or even individual blocks if they break. They're held together by cables so that they can be put in place really easily like this. But actually, once they're down, they, they go in, uh, along the edge and they cut the cables. So these things are sort of, these are free floating once they put the lights. And if a block gets broken for some reason, you can pull it out and they replace it with it. So this product is called Paveyard. Again, I don't receive a nickel for any of these product endorsements. Um, it just, um, I was speaking, they had me speaking um, in Baltimore in 2010, and I met the person. around in a few years, come talk to us in the Midwest. And uh, we did. And so we did. Um, again, that's what it looks like in the winter. Um, kind of gave you the speed version of this presentation. These are uh, some contacts if you're interested.
did, the City of Shoreview's website also has links to this information and more about permit go papers, a lot more technical information if you're interested in getting standpoint. Um, we have a natural resource specialist um, on staff in our department that can also speak to these issues and a lot of other innovative um, stormwater So I see some questions as well. Okay. okay. Um, I guess let's just do one question when you get on to the next one. And, and I'm available. I'm available. There was a question in the back. Yeah, I'm just wondering, um, like, in terms of assessments, do you do assessments or projects like this, or did you see problems with your assessments? The question has to do with uh, assessments for public improvements and project costs. And I will come right out and say that in both of the permeable papers, Examples I showed you here today. Uh, we went into the project knowing that our project costs were 10% higher than they would have been if we had built it um, using traditional infrastructure. Our city council said do it anyways because they believe that the life cycle and the life cycle cost associated with owning these streets and not taking care of the storm sewer system would cancel out. That is how they found that approach to be cost effective. Our street assessments for the project were unaffected by that decision. Our street assessments in, in Shoreview are, uh, for whatever reason, based only on the cost of curb and gutter, which is the same regardless of what kind of pavement. So we've got no pushback. And the last, uh, and because you set me up with that question, the neighborhood where we did this paved grade project approached the city for a permeable pavement alternative to their project area next to a lake, um, concerns about water quality. Uh, I mentioned a 30-foot public road right away. They didn't like any of the alternatives for building the urban infrastructure. And they actually approached the city and said, why don't you look at a permeable pavement option? So this is beautiful. It's actually now coming from the community as opposed to um, So with that, I think I'm done. Green, two lake 
is another uh, improvement. Uh, we have a long series of rain gardens and a great photo of the pond on the right there. Uh, was a level three contaminated pond. Um, like Mark mentioned, uh, that's a big challenge. We worked on several different levels of contamination on the surface of our pond. One of our goals for this area is uh, there are a lot of BMP improvements here that uh, we hope to utilize in the future for education. Currently, our gardens have been planned. They've been completed late um, September, October. Another uh, photograph, uh, we, do, we do have a clean water partnership uh, on this uh, with the MPCA and uh, Harvard County. Uh, we did utilize the cave drain as well. Uh, in the parking lot to help with uh, some of our stormwater mitigation. Uh, unlike Mark's, ours is placed by hand um, because of the narrower parking area. Some of the things we're working on is apples. And a couple other things, private, some of our private partnership items. Uh, this whole parking lot area used to be gravel, and so uh, the WMO in our county had funds work with the local businesses to try to eliminate that red rock runoff. So this, uh, we did agreement with the property owner, uh, placed a buffer around the uh, right-of-way area, which we planted trees and planted in, uh, and then created a, a narrow strip of cave drain to pick up the surface runoff. The garage is back here, is adjacent property as well we did, uh, that's a new restaurant model with the current structure, but we did employ parking with them as well, and one of the reasons that we targeted this area was, aside from the red rock, was the flooding of these garages and now. So it was a very concerned citizens back here with these new applications going on, but so far the rewards have been very beneficial. Some of our goals and challenges that we see coming for us in Marconia, um, we're currently in the process of three stormwater reuse projects. Um, mandated, bought one by a large linear uh, transportation project in the Auto Trunk Highway 5. Uh, the second portion of that, we are intending to do uh, reuse distribution for resale uh, in the adjacent commercial areas. And then, uh, Stormwater credits are a big thing in development and future projects, so we're working uh, quite a bit on other projects with reuse so we can maintain some credits with our local uh, water management organizations utilizing our downtown and future work. We may have difficulty meeting some of the stormwater work from us. Balancing funding, I think that's a big challenge for everybody in this industry. Uh, Reduction improvements. And I think education for the public is another component that we strive to challenge with uh, every year. We hold open houses, uh, we get out to the public, knock on doors as much as possible, and uh, we do send out reminders if we do find violations that are even if grass clippings or something left in the street, we follow up with that. And maximizing our BMPs uh, to meet those PMDL requirements. Um, we're pretty fortunate that uh, we don't have major issues, but we have several things like this. This is uh, one of our first rain gardens that uh, we put in front of City Hall. Uh, this one here actually fills completely to the path of the every time rain in the hard surface area. One of our about all I have is pretty fast. Yes. When you put in the paved drain, did you need to excavate? Uh, if you have clay under that? Or what did you do? The yeah, so the question was excavation under a paved drain. Right. Um, we did have to excavate. It has the same underdrain, similar to what Mark spoke of and showed. Uh, drain tile is set up a little bit higher. So we have some capacity for infiltration. But the clay soils are very heavy in there. And adjacent to that project, we actually had to do helical piling to hold up some of the utilities to be in that area. So it's a very unstable soil type. Any 
any other, we'd have time for one or two more questions. On the uh, patron installation, I couldn't tell from the photograph, is there a large area tributary to the infiltration area? Um, there is not. It's mostly just the parking lot. That's why we went with the narrower strip, um, just with the parking. Uh, so that area was very defined, very small. Um, beyond upstream from this a little bit, we're, we're doing some other practices as well. A tree break system, uh, containment system that captures part of another small parking lot, and we have some more infiltration that's captured water off in the chamber. Very limited there. How are you guys doing with your tree canopy? Do you have a lot of ash trees? Or? Yeah, so our tree canopy in the community, uh, we just recently have worked with Tree Trust on that. Uh, it's not quite a completed project. We do have a lot of ash trees. Um, we specifically target those areas, both spring and fall with sweeping. We use the, the U of M sweeping calculator to monitor our, our reduction levels. Uh, so we do have targets. We created watershed areas specifically for sweeping to track it. So all maps. Yeah, a lot of trees in the community. There are tree cities where we can hold that one. All right. Thank you very much. Which is 
funded by the American Public Works, Public Works Association, American Society of Civil Engineers, uh, American Council of Engineering Families, and it was also developed uh, in partnership with the document program at Harvard. So it evaluates how sustainable public infrastructure projects are. And it can be used all throughout the project from planning, design, construction to operation. Uh, and it covers the triple bottom line. So I was getting into this earlier about how there are your environmental goals for a project and stormwater water management. We talked about those a lot. But there are also the social and economic objectives, which are important. The framework applies to all civil infrastructure, and this becomes really important, especially when you're looking at road projects. These are all the types of projects that can be evaluated using a vision. In a few minutes, we'll go over how we evaluated a road project, but just in case you know, roads include a lot of infrastructure along them. So Start having to consider stormwater management, let's say public transit, parks, bike and step pathways. So the rating system has 60 performance objectives and credits, you can call them, and they're organized into five categories. All I won't go into each of the credits, that would take a while, um, but I will introduce you to the five categories. They're showing here quality of life. Leadership, resource allocation, natural world. Resource allocation might be the very typical thing that comes to mind when you think of sustainability, reducing the cycle. Um, but there are many other views on what sustainability is and what it means to the world. Those are covered by the other categories. So, first, quality of life. This, the credits in this category evaluate how the project impacts the health and well-being of a community, and that's from individuals to the whole social fabric. One example of a credit is encouraging the use of alternative modes of transportation. You might think, well, that's more for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It is. That's considered another credit. But in terms of quality of life, if you're encouraging people to use bike and walk and transit that reduces congestion, which prevents you know, from sitting in gridlock. Um, and it also makes it nicer for people to bike through other neighborhoods. The second category is leadership. And this looks for a commitment to sustainability at all levels of a project, from the owners or implementers of a project to designers and uh, people that construct it. of what the credits would consider. They would look for collaboration, getting different types of designers and uh, stakeholders at the table discussing what's important for this project. And it also looks for leaders to commit to sustainability goals for the project at a broad level. The third category is resource allocation, like I mentioned. It's looking for projects to reduce, reuse, and recycle materials site and water, and it's looking for uh, more renewable resources used for energy. An example I'm showing here is soil stockpile on site. Uh, one of the credits will uh, recognize if a site minimizes the amount of uh, excavated material taken off site. So that 
that you're mitigating climate change, and uh, also how infrastructure can adapt uh, and be resilient to short-term and long-term hazards. Uh, an example here is encouraging the use of hybrid vehicles. For all 60 of the credits in those categories, for each one, a level of achievement is determined. And these levels of achievement are on the top there. They range from benchmark to restorative. Benchmark doesn't get you any points, but that's your standard practice. That's what's expected and what you need to do to meet regulations these days. This group is just a step above uh, the benchmark or conventional. And then there's a gradient of levels of achievement uh, until you reach conserving, and that's um, one that I would like to highlight because that's the, the first level of achievement where zero negative impact is occurring due to your project. Step above that is having a restorative impact. You're restoring the social and natural system. So how can you apply? Well, you can. Uh, get trained in the Envision system. It can really help you uh, see new considerations that uh, you can make in your design or planning or um, operation of infrastructure. You can use the system. Uh, it can have a lot of great and helpful language to tackle all this. Uh, you can use it to communicate and articulate the sustainability goals of your project.
you're also engaging stakeholders throughout the process. And we actually heard that when they started these stakeholder meetings, people didn't actually think that they were looking for actual feedback on the project. But it started so early on that you can see these are the options, which ones you prefer, and it really built in uh, stakeholder feedback to the project design. So that's a big community trust. Challenges with that as well. Uh, the city also recycles their pavement into the road as um, It's a lot. It, we've heard a lot today about uh, reducing impervious and reducing the impervious project. And that was, although the city was adding bike lanes and sidewalks to a lot of roads that didn't have them, they were also reducing the length. Of so that was uh, a major step to reducing or um, at least limiting the increase in runoff. And they also implemented infiltration tests as well. So I'll just go through and highlight a couple of the recommendations. Um, I mentioned that stakeholder engagement in the integrated neighborhood approach to their projects, recommendations in the event, and build off of it. They're really going out and engaging residents throughout these neighborhoods. Um, They have to do it to that level for these road reconstruction projects. So we were encouraging them to use that opportunity to encourage residents to implement their own rain gardens and stormwater improvement at the lot level. Um, we also found that uh, for quick improvements, there wasn't really sufficient documentation kept around after these projects were designed and constructed to fully evaluate how sustainable they were. So we recommended that they improve those practices. Um, and there were also a few minor updates that they could make to design standards for street lighting and landscaping that could bring them up to the latest sustainability standards. There are a number of other recommendations we made for larger planning and policy uh, and standard level improvements, um, but I won't get into that today. These were just a Lastly, for longer term priorities is looking at the lifespan of their roads. Um, we're hearing a lot about perpetual pavement design and designing roads to last not 20 or 30 years, but 50 or more years. Um, and as a stormwater designer, when I hear that, I hear, well, then everything underground has to last just as long or longer than that. Um, so really uh, starting to encourage them to
place. They want to kind of actually bring back some of the more finer grid systems. When it went to industrial, it tended to get broken back up into very large parcels, and now they want to kind of bring it back down into this finer grid system and be able to put in housing in a little more walkable kind of community. So putting this green street um, part of it was actually very important to the overall vision for the West Side Flat Street as well. Here's just to touch on this. There are a lot of different systems to analyze through this, throughout this, because again, it's important if you think about sustainability and kind of living streets that have to serve many purposes. Um, so there's certainly a lot of uh, attention and thought put into uh, bikeways, uh, pedestrian movements throughout the area, as well as mass transit. The public arts part of it, but this also kind of shows the you know, training and thinking of the connectivity from the existing downtown over to the West Side Flats, and then also really this whole river corridor, one of the bigger visions. An earlier study along the Mississippi River was also just doing better having the communities reconnect to the river. So there's a lot of emphasis talking about how to get the neighborhoods and all the other rest of the community back down to the river. So for quite a while, the city has sort of turned back on the river and just kind of a heavy industry corridor. Now it's trying to use that as an economic anchor for redevelopment of that whole riverfront area and reconnecting to that riverfront. The green space is along the river. So I'll let carry that on down to this end. Other interesting areas is kind of a bluff line right behind those. So in terms of the living streets, the part we work a lot on and the water management um, in here, we kind of had three main themes that we talked about. Uh, one was kind of Green Boulevard, some of these major east-west roads and the, the you know, walkway along the riverfront. Um, there would be a lot of high amenity, kind of bigger spaces that could be worked with in terms of green space. Um, like I say, I'll just kind of move through these quickly just to kind of give you a flavor of, of what uh, this could look like in different settings. The second um, priority larger area was this an idea of green fingers that came from an earlier study. Um, how do we think about how the river corridor connects to the rest of the community? So these, these um, spokes that come off of the river, and this one we look at probably a linear park system, uh, but the others will largely be done along the existing and future street um, corridors. That connection will have to be part of the street scheme uh, put in here. Schematics down here, you know, things that could be done to irrigate, um, capture and reuse the water. And I'll have some more examples, we'll look at those a little more. In detail, we'll go through them in great detail, but show some more of the detail. On it. And this was the third, <coughs> the third part of it, just you know, green streets in general, but kind of the fabric of all the streets here, but they break this up into a finer grid. Um, all of these streets would have some level of green streets incorporated into them. So the next area of the slide, and just uh, run through them quickly, but gives an idea of you know, depending on what your street is, how big the right of way is. This is one of the bigger right of ways, 100 feet, 80 feet of pavement. This is a major water shop. Major thoroughfare, so they know there's going to be a lot going on in the street. Um, bikeways, pedestrians, sidewalks, and then a lot of lanes because so it's a major thoroughfare. So that has to be accommodated. And then looking at what the opportunities are to do this wider corridor, you may have enough room to do a superficial rain garden as well as do some underground stormwater treatment that can both treat the rain road corridor as well as well some of the private development that great and choose it area. That ranges all to more uh, kind of smaller streets that aren't quite as major, but it's still a kind of east-west connector. Um, maybe there'd be a little boulevard off to the side where you could do some kind of irrigation reuse. That was mentioned in one of the other presentations. Actually store that water, bring it back up, and irrigate some of these urban greenscapes, because that's often needed for the urban greenscapes to have a backup from water supply, as well as the rain garden. Um, it makes the intersections more safe if you can kind of do bump outs and then utilize that for rain gardens. Um, and this is more like 50 feet of pavement, 100 feet of right away. Plato Boulevard was kind of an interesting one down in the south. It already has an existing uh, center median, so the idea was to really kind of work with that and come up with a center median feature that takes care of stormwater green space, as well as then having um, like a, a bikeway, a dedicated bikeway as long as well as the sidewalks. So again, just trying to look at how all these different practices can be mixed and matched depending on what your setting is. Some of these more urban areas, it may be more like a tree trench where you've got a tree and really most everything's underground and all you're seeing is maybe just the pavement on top. Um, the water is going down and feeding that tree root, something that's maybe more above ground where you have an actual feature. So this is done for a whole variety of them, um, different kind of configurations, anywhere from you know 60 to 80 foot right away, smaller lanes, um, different kind of configurations, too much uh, wider. So this I thought just give a nice sort of overview of how different streets and different functions can all be integrated um, to also take care of creating, take care of stormwater and also create green space so it's a much more desirable street needs to be on. That's really what they, they want to bring back that walkable vitality to these neighborhoods 
where people enjoy being out on the street and want to walk down to the shop and store and get a coffee. So they want it to also be a very inviting kind of street. That's a very central thing to what they are trying to accomplish. Let's just a quick overview of what this might look like in a fairly urban type of setting. That's all I have. So if you have questions at the right time, yeah, you died over the bus they left. I guess we'll have to wrap up. Um, so if you have questions, if you have questions, you can contact the troop from EOR, Fred and Olivia. Um, I'll have these presentations online in the next few days email everybody so you'll have that contact information or you can connect with them now um, unless you're on the webinar. And so just um, thank you again for coming. Um, sorry about some of the audio issues in the webinar. Um, next month, April 12th, we have Building Reuse. So there will be more information coming up on the Eventbrite with um, the agenda that can be filled out. Right. Thank you. And then, yeah. <laughs> on resilience because it touches on so many of these topics and a lot of them you get double credit for so much yeah. stormwater best practices and resilience best practices. So just check it out on um heat island reduction and um you know green streets and, and related the, topics. And similar so we have also sessions on including resilience in your company to plan update because it's a new optional chapter that Eric is our, our content person for the Med Council. So we had 11 cities that joined us for the Anoka County session, and we have sessions for Ramsey, Hennepin, and Washington County coming up at the end of the month. So I have flyers here, and we'll be emailing you guys about seeing your folks to come. So for people to hear that on the webinar, just um, a pitch for Best Practice 29 on resiliency. Um, a lot of these stormwater best practices relate and are even able to double count. For those, to make sure to take a look at BP Best Practice 29 on the Green Step website, and then there's some um, integrating best practice uh, stormwater with your comp plan that aligns for sustainability is going to be putting on. You'll probably receive some emails about that from Sean. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you for coming out. Right there. Yeah. 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 Yeah.